It's here. We just published TV 2.1, the first of our motion-related test bench updates. It covers tests related to cadence, including judder, micro judder, and the newly rechristened response time stutter. You can find all the details on what's changed in the change log on our website here. Today, we'll get into the differences between stutter, judder, and micro judder, and go over the changes we've made to address them. We're confident that this update brings us one step closer to fixing what's broken. But we're just getting started. The terms judder and stutter are often used interchangeably because they look similar and are usually most apparent in panning shots, but they refer to different phenomena. Judder is primarily caused by the difficulty in displaying 24 frames per second on a 60 hertz display. Since most modern TVs refresh at either 60 or 120 hertz, and most cinematic content is 24 or 25 FPS, displaying that content evenly becomes a challenge. To do so, most TVs use a technique called pulldown. A 3 to 2 pulldown technique, for instance, would repeat every odd frame three times and every even frame twice, effectively translating 24 FPS into 60 FPS. But as a result, we get judder. That uneven frame rate alternating between two and three frames creates the perception that every other frame is slightly faster. For older TVs with fixed refresh rates, this was a big problem. Today, however, TVs can either increase their refresh rates or lower them down to an intermediate frame rate, leading to new pull-down strategies like 2 to 2 for 48 hertz or 5 to 5 for 120 hertz. These don't add any judder because the frames repeat in even ratios. While strategies can vary depending on the exact TV and streaming source, the key thing to note here is that the judder artifact will only be present when A, the video stream received by the TV has a non-uniform pulldown, like 3 to 2, and B, it can't perform any kind of de-judder correction. The good news is that most TVs can de-judder content just fine. Of the 70 TVs we have on the Testbench 2.0, for example, only 17 of them can't. TestBedge 2.1, however, adds a bit more nuance. Instead of a simple yes or no comparison, we now evaluate how well a TV can handle Judder. Because PAL content is increasingly available to stream in NTSC regions, we've also added 25p Judder tests, making them more useful to our friends across the pond too. To conduct our Judder tests, we play a 24 and 25 FPS video that cycles a white square through 24 or 25 slots respectively, over the course of one second. At the same time, we capture a photo of the screen using a one second exposure. If all of the boxes are of a uniform shade, that means each square was displayed for the same amount of time, indicating a judder-free and uniform frame rate. If, however, the pattern is uneven, with brighter or darker shaded squares, that means judder is present. From our initial batch of 10 TVs, only the LG UT75 failed to display 24 FPS from a 60 Hz signal, with the checkerboard pattern revealing the 3 to 2 pulldown process. Looking at 25p content, the results get a bit more interesting. None of our 10 TVs can de-judder 25p content via 60 FPS properly, but some do a better job than others, meaning judder will appear better or worse depending on the TV. For example, the Samsung QN90F is the worst offender so far, with three different shades of gray indicating greater inconsistency in the duration of the frames. The LG G5, as you can see, is a lot more uniform, even if it's not fully de-juddered. For that reason, we now assign a score to every TV's judder performance. If the TV can de-judder a certain signal without issue, it gets a perfect 10. Otherwise, the score is determined subjectively based on the number of equal rectangles, the number of different shades of gray, and the perceptual impact on real content. Next up, Micro judder. Micro judder is the subtle choppiness that comes from dropped frames, often caused by de judder processing during scenes with complex motion. That means you won't see any micro judder if a TV doesn't have a de juddering capability. You're also less likely to see it when you're using the TV's native apps or when using the match frame rate setting on an Apple TV, for instance. We've added a new test to address micro judder, and it's pretty simple. After ensuring that de judder settings are enabled, we play two different panning scenes for 24p and 25p content. Then, our testers simply evaluate the cliffs for any signs of micro judder. Each scene is replayed three times to ensure the frame drop isn't a one-time issue. Out of our first batch, the Sony TV struggled with micro judder the most when using a streaming device via 60p. In particular, setting Cinemotion to high can lead to noticeable micro judder artifacts. 
If you have a Sony, we suggest sticking with native apps or using match frame rate settings on an external streaming device. The Samsung QN90F was also a bit of an outlier. It was difficult to evaluate a 25p via 60p because the de-judder is so bad that it produces a constant rate of micro-judder. Even though the frame drops are consistent, we still rank this as micro-judder since it's an unwanted side effect and may still be distracting. Finally, the Hisense UAQG was a nightmare to test for micro-judder since it was very finicky about which video format we sent to it. Though it passes our current micro judder tests for 25p content, some video formats or even specific scenes could still trigger micro judder, like this scene from episode 6 of The Queen's Gambit. For now, we're only evaluating micro judder for different frame rate modes, but all signs suggest that other more demanding tasks, like video format processing and motion interpolation, can also create micro judder. If warranted, we may end up expanding this test down the road. Finally, there's stutter. This is the most complicated of the three cadence artifacts and the most difficult to fix. That's because stutter is impacted by many factors, including refresh rate, brightness, screen size, sample and hold strategy, the scene you're watching, and even your own individual sensitivity to it. The reason we see stutter comes back to those pesky low frame rates. To illustrate, let's look at a time position diagram representing the movement of a pixel from left to right at 240 pixels per second, transitioning from bright gray to dark gray at each frame. A theoretically infinite frame rate would appear as a smooth, continuous diagonal line. This is the ideal, perfectly fluid motion. However, motion in video doesn't work that way. Movies or videos are made up of a series of static images in quick enough succession to create the illusion of motion. And when that motion is captured at lower frame rates, the perceived gap between each frame creates a stuttering effect. As you increase the frame rate, the gap between frames gets smaller and motion appears closer to the continuous line of fluid movement. CRT and plasma TVs are often held up as the gold standard for motion handling amongst TV technologies, and that largely comes down to the way they display frames. Generally speaking, the frame hold time is much shorter than on LCD and OLED TVs. Because of that, motion appears much closer to the ideal motion line. The trade-off is that these methods can also cause flicker and reduce brightness. LCD and OLED displays, meanwhile, use a sample and hold strategy that improves brightness and reduces flicker, but makes stutter much more noticeable. Stutter is more noticeable on OLED TVs because of their near instantaneous response times. On LCD screens, slower response times make for more gradual pixel transitions, which makes the position gap between each frame less apparent, especially with slower moving objects. The downside, however, is added motion blur. Outside of the sample and hold strategy, brightness is the next most important factor. Stutter perception can be reduced by lowering the brightness of your screen. We recreated this in our lab by making OLED TVs appear better stutter-wise than LCD TVs simply by reducing the brightness. Lastly, the size of your TV will impact how much stutter is perceived. For example, a bar moving 10 pixels per frame will create a noticeably larger gap on a 100-inch TV compared to a 55-inch TV when viewed at the same distance. In our own testing, when viewing a 42-inch OLED and a 65-inch LCD side-by-side -side from the same distance, observers tended to prefer the OLED. Beyond the TV itself, the type and speed of motion in the scene, as well as how it was recorded, can amplify the perception of stutter. When your eyes can follow the movement, the continuous eye motion conflicts with the discrete movement of the display. Panning shots that are too slow or too fast may diminish the perception of stutter. But if it's in that sweet spot of being slow enough for your eyes to track it, the stutter will be more noticeable. A lot of this is individual too. Some people may only notice stutter during slow pans, while others are bothered by it in every scene. While our tests can't account for variables like brightness, size, or user sensitivity, we've renamed our existing stutter test to response time stutter to better reflect that our test only covers one slice of the pie. The test itself remains unchanged. We calculate stutter as the inverse of a TV's response time. The faster the response time, the more noticeable the stutter. For those sensitive to stutter, that might influence choosing an LCD over an OLED. But individual experiences vary. For some, stutter may not factor into their decision at all over other criteria. So, if stutter is an unavoidable artifact of TV technology advancing, what can you do about it? 
Well, motion enhancement features like BFI and motion interpolation are currently the only ways to really address stutter. BFI, or black frame insertion, inserts additional black frames into the content to effectively reduce the hold time of every frame. This allows sample and hold displays to play a bit more nicely with our cognitive processing of motion to reduce the appearance of stutter. But approaches to BFI vary amongst TVs, and they can sometimes interfere with a TV's de-judder function, so you may end up trading stutter for judder. Motion interpolation, meanwhile, can be a bit of a sticky subject. Some people dislike the soap opera effect it creates, while others much prefer it to seeing any kind of stutter in their content. With minimal use, however, you can reduce stutter without turning days of heaven into days of our lives. Ultimately, it's up to you to figure out your preferred balance between honoring the way content was intended to be displayed and enabling processing techniques that can reduce artifacts like stutter. TVs have come a long way over the past 100 years. They're bigger, brighter, and better. But our content is still largely shot using the same 24 FPS standard from a century ago. It's what gives cinema its distinctive look. So the solution is more complicated than just increasing frame rates at the expense of artistic practices. What we need is technology that can bridge the gap between high frame rates and cinematic appearance. Thankfully, there's a lot of potential on the horizon. True Cut Motion is one tool that may suggest a way forward. It lets filmmakers motion grade their films to adjust the frame rate based on the content and movement within a scene. We've already seen it used in some recent high frame rate movies like Avatar The Way of Water and The Wild Robot. Meanwhile, the release of Dolby Vision 2 also promises to give creators more fine-tuned control over motion and allows motion data to be embedded in content. That metadata could be used, for example, to allow TVs to automatically enable and disable motion interpolation depending on the scene. As far as motion is concerned, the future is potentially as bright as the latest mini LED TVs. But as far as what's next for us? Well, we're already hard at work on Testbench 2.2, which will address motion blur. If you have any feedback about the current Testbench or what you'd like to see regarding blur, now is the time to chime in. Send us your comments, questions, and suggestions. We want them all. You can also read about all of the changes and our methodologies in the links down below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, I'm Marco from Ratings.com, where we help you find the best product for your needs.